Um, hey everybody, how's it going? Uh, today we're talking see about... whatever number this is. Today we're talking Nine. about uh, well, our... where we started counting this three on three. three. Yeah, five. five. Yeah. Five uh, today we're talking about our 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 bones and how they crack because yeah. you know we as, uh, as everybody except for on here except for Annika is over the age of thirty. All right. But I mean, I still have problems though. So. <laughs> Caden does. I swear, Caden snaps more than I do. Well, so, so I just have major shoulder problems uh, from falling down two years ago uh, when I dislocated my shoulder. So. Okay, I, I should I should not be laughing because that is a horrible story. Oh, yeah. my and, and also, like, I love that we had an entire topic ready to talk about for this, and no. I will point out that oh, we during, train during the green room time, during the green room time, I did note that we would talk about absolutely nothing. And then once it started, we would talk about nothing again. <laughs> Hashtag so special. the topic for today is actually last night's episode. Uh, yes. That's what we're talking about uh, last night's episode of, uh, of Yas in which the intrepid adventurers, uh, searched for the uh, next portal. And on the way, they find a, um, a group of owl bears. They do some rescuing. Uh, and then uh, they meet a, um, a new family and go into the portal. So um, does anybody have anything they want to say about the owl bears and like about that experience as your character? Like what was your, what was your character's like initial reaction to seeing this parliament sleuth of owl bears parliament sleuth yeah um yeah. i i thought it was really i was thinking about this today because i was like okay we're gonna talk about this i should think have a thought on it and my thought was that i thought it was really interesting the way it was set up where it automatically the way that sarah described the scene it didn't feel like a necessarily a threatening encounter but it felt like a tense encounter and i really loved how we have this group who is like very unsubmissive characters like we are all characters who are very uh i rush in or um like rush in to protect each other or whatever but we always have we're always very forward thinking and moving forward people and that all of us basically sort of in our own ways took a submissive approach pretty immediately to try and defuse the situation and so i really i really liked that switch in tone uh for our characters that it wasn't is finland gonna ride a giant lizard like a like a cowboy it was, you know, it was, it was such a nice kind of mix, like, I'm going to say mix up, I was like, right, but like twist, where everybody had to kind of think outside their usual modus operandi, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Anybody? Yeah, definitely. Um, so what I, one thing that I have discovered about Jack is that unlike my other characters that I tend to play, she actually does, t she, she is not, she is not submissive. And also um, she takes that protective role a lot. She, she is cautious. Um, she's not going to rush in. She is going to hang out at the back and be the one that like, okay, there is that immediate threat. Is there a threat that we are not seeing? Um, and so it was, uh, it, I, I liked the fact that, you know, she ended up saying, okay, I'm going to sit back here and watch for a change in behavior because we are dealing with a mama bear, a mama owl bear. But um, so, yes, it, we, 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 and, and, and I appreciated that, you know, she did end up coming forward to the front um, to, to like, she's got, she's literally got the toughest skin. She's going to be the one to go into those brambles. But, um, 
it was uh, it was interesting to experience her um, go from okay, th- this is the threat level. What uh, what do I do to a keep my uh, crew safe and also accomplish the uh, the goal here? Because she had to make a decision whether it was safer to put down her weapons and make sure Mama Bear didn't snap suddenly versus make sure that her team didn't get scratched up by the brambles heading in there, which could have been just as bad. Uh, what about, uh, did, uh, Robin or, or, I mean, I know Aster did a little, uh, shape-shifting there, oh, I was but, like, Aster uh, did basically jack shit, so. Uh, I feel like Aster shaped and then it. ate popcorn watching us. Oh, yeah. Aster did jack shit and just watched and enjoyed what was going on. Judged. Because Aster's like, mm, I don't deal with animals, that's not my thing, and just kind of, like, stood <laughs> up to the side, uh, dressed as a bird. That was so And Robin's like, though. I have a tool for that! Robin's like, I have tools. I have a tool for that. Yeah, Robin definitely uh, approaches everything with optimistic, happy, wide eyes and just wants to fix everything. Never would have come at those owlbears with any kind of aggression unless they literally were ripping apart one of Robin's, you know, loved ones. So uh, it was really fun for Robin to get to see something adorable because Robin does take great interest in I think all sorts of things whether they are adorable or terrifying Robin seems to approach everything with the same sort of like that's so great and it was a great opportunity for me to do another sketch for Robin um it's my sketchbook <laughs> which I, I love I'm not an artist myself which I'm sure anyone who watches the show has figured out since uh, you can see my sketches but I like to imagine that Robin is actually quite talented and so i know that the the uh, podcast listeners can't see this but robin sketched a little owlbear stuck in the brambles um with some blood because the owlbear was was definitely hurt but it was great to have that inspiration um for the the robin sketch of the we discovered that it's a cublet right a cublet the cublet yeah because it's a mix between a, a bear cub and an oh, yeah. owlet, so it's a yeah, cublet. Right. A little owl. That was super cublet. cute. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, yeah, mine. Yeah, I was gonna say owl bears have always been one of those um, critters in D and D that always end up being like a terrifying encounter because they are pretty, pretty tough. Um, and in the past, they've always been something that my characters have fought. So getting to do something not that it was pretty great because they're honestly one of my like one of my top critter types that I just I like clearly not as much as you know honestly you anything that's an mechanical. Owlbear. They're so precious. Why would well? Well, most of the time in most of the time in D and D, when owl bears are seen and they have their encounters and adventuring parties, they're always seen. They're always played as extraordinarily aggressive, and they're 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 attacking the party or whatever it is. So that's one reason why I wanted to do this owl bear encounter that was not that. It was an owl because, as most of the time, especially with anything that is classified as a beast, or uh, technically owl bears are monstrosity monstrosities but they're also technically as unaligned if something is unaligned there is no they have no they have no priorities except for food shelter water you know you know family kind of thing that's when we think so like when you encounter a bear the bear is just living its life if it becomes aggressive it's probably because right the humanoid is doing something to make it aggressive whatever it is yeah. and so yeah, like, like that, right, those, those past encounters have always been yeah. like under the guise of you have entered their territory. This is a ruin right. or a cave or a whatever where they have they have set up their nest. Yeah, let's go with that. 
um right wow. and you entered right and so like what would you expect if it were a kodiak right yeah and that's so that's just murder it for trying to defend its home well it's a it's a no i wouldn't say that it's imagine you encounter a kodiak in the wild on its turf and it attacks you what do you do right right do you, Am I and magical? That's, right and so do that have... that is that is traditionally how owl bears are uh, like appear in D and D worlds as basically feathered Kodiaks. Um, and so getting to see this, like they're just like family. the softer side, <laughs> the softer <laughs> side, <laughs> owl bears. The softer side. They're so I mean, soft. And if down I'm literally in real life, and mm -hmm. I encounter a Kodiak bear. I would just get out my D20 and roll for animal handling. <laughs> Duh. And get right. eaten. Totally. Fine. <laughs> Duh. Um, it, it just, I, I can't help but like th my, my partner and I have a uh, like inside joke between us that like, I think moose are really fascinating and really exciting. And They're I Megafana. really want to- They yeah, are. They are. They're terrifying huge. in person. Terrifying um, in person. Yeah, they are. All, and and I am. Uh, uh, my partner is legitimately more concerned about running into a moose in the wild than a Kodiak bear. Um, because no, they're terrifying. Yeah. Be, because like Co luckily, Kodiak bears. Luckily, we're in. Yeah, we're. Luckily, we're in Texas, and we don't have to deal with either no. one of those things. But in Texas, we do have gators. So there is that. And um. I, I I finally like saw the how big a moose is because like in my yep. mind I was just kind of going okay I big moose, deer. yeah big deer like cows <laughs> cows with gigantic antlers like that's what I was thinking and it's like, like yeah you don't want to with legs <laughs> yeah it, they're twelve feet tall I did not comprehend that the first um, time I ever saw one for like the first two minutes the only word that would come out of my mouth was big like <laughs> all I could manage. So, this is a side story that uh, I played another D&D game with Ari it's actually how Ari and I met and uh, one of the other players in that game loves moose. She's originally from Michigan. Moose are her favorite animals. She fucking loves them. And so we were talking about moose one time and we started talking about megafauna. And so Eric's like, what are megafauna? And I just start sending links to the, our group chat <laughs> about what megafauna are. And she's like, no, I do not like it. Because I'm sending her like, of, like old extinct megafauna yeah. with like the endocathiers. And like, and I was like, it's like this giant giraffe, rhino. Um, and I was like the big mega, like big giant sloths from like South America and like the armadillos. And she was like, I was like, yeah, they were like the size of a VW bug. And she was like, nope. Like, nope. nope. Like, so every time, so this is an FYI, megafauna really creep area out. So indigenous, indigenous population of the Americas used those shells as like tents for like hunting. Yeah, yeah that's how big they were. They were like a pup tent. Like, yeah, dang. Yeah, no, they're huge. And so there are very but, few megafauna creatures still alive, and moose are some of them. And moose, yeah, are one of the very few. So to to bring the seg train coaster uh, back in into the station, I still hate that <laughs> word. I want a better word. Um, I think when we, because we've talked about we've talked about this topic when we talk about races, where we're like, just because yeah. it says a thing about a race in the book. You can make it what you want. Um, you can ditch the whole lawful evil thing or whatever. Well, you know, all of these monstrosities and beasts and such are the equivalent of animals in our real world. And when you think about the gamut of animals in our world, you can overlay the same ideas. They're not all going to be vicious and territorial. Um, some of them may be very um, timid and shy and skittish. And so kind of, you know, play with it and slot it into your world in a way that I think I think the bottom line is, especially for somebody like me who's been playing d and for so long, I want an encounter to feel fresh. Like there's so many times at the gaming table 
where um you know where the dm starts to describe something and i already know what that creature is before they've even named it and in my head i'm already thinking about its stats and like what it takes to you know kill them and uh, and all of that kind of stuff right that's already going through my head and then i have to take a step back because i'm like does my character know this and usually i ask would my character know about this this creature but to encounter a well-known pretty beloved beast in D&D in a completely new context it makes you go back to the very very first time you ever encountered one and you were like okay what am I doing how do I get through this um and so I appreciate that I I certainly appreciate I don't want every encounter to be the same <laughs> like oh it's a Tanya. Oh, here's the thing here Tanya mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that was my first time with an owlbear my first owlbear Oh. Well, I'm glad they were gentle. But now my expectation is so, going to be real off, apparently. Yeah, no, it's gonna, time like, in a different look, game. I, I am. Oh my god, these are outliers. They're super all chill. <laughs> yeah, I all of like I will subvert all of those things. I can't wait packs. for the game now where Pax is playing with other people and there's an owl bear and Pax is like, I run up and hug it. <laughs> Save its baby. I hope you made a second character. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here's, I, have, I, have, I have the information on owl bears here. And granted, this is just like any, it's, I have the monster mail in front of me because I also have the information on Yeti, which we will get to because this goes back yeah. to the not playing things as normal. So, information on owl bears, it talks about like how owl bear origins, scholars have long debated how they came about. It's da 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 da. Well, the way that I was playing them in there is that they're just natural creatures who exist. There was no mage a million years ago that combined an owl and a bear. Right. They are just creatures. They just exist. This is a world where dragons and merfolk and magic and whatever, they exist. So why can't an owl bear exist? It's like so, Avatar The Last Airbender. Exactly. I was thinking the same thing. Everything, everything is like a mix of bear. stuff. Yeah, and then you where it's like, it's bear just a bear. Like, just says bear. What? <laughs> bear. That's a bear. Bear, bear, bear. Yeah. Um, bear, so bear bear. bear, bear. Yes, bear, bear, bear. Butch bear. Uh, it's like gorilla, <laughs> gorilla, gorilla. Bug bear is not even remotely a bear. Or yeah. a bug. Oh no, we lost packs. Oh no. Oh, um, no. Everybody um, don't move. The overlay is now messed up. Yeah, uh, uh, Annika is okay now. Okay, now Pax is coming back. I'll let Annika deal with that. So. Over. Annika, are we good? Yeah. Yeah, Pax I was is back. I was last in, so hopefully it put me You're back, back where you had me. So, that's um, so that's why I wanted to kind of like subvert like bears don't live in packs. Owls don't live in packs. Owls live solitary lives. Bears live solitary lives. But I don't care. It's a made up world. I can do what I want. Owl bears don't exist in real life. Owl bears live in, in familial packs. Why? Because I said so, and this is the world that we built together, and this is what I want to do. You do not, this is, if, this is back to Sarah's DM tips. This is a guideline. They're it just not, guidelines. And you have to say yeah, it with a kind of pirate this is not. Yeah, I was gonna say, Sarah, Sarah is a D&D &D pirate. Yeah, <laughs> they're more like guidelines. <laughs> These are not hard and fast. Next to it is the uh, Otiug. It's what, AKA a shit monster. But um, uh, here, the owl bear guidelines. Use them, guidelines. but don't take it as gospel. I mean, whoever wrote this, they have their own way of playing the creatures. Which brings me to when I talked about how I stole the Yeti from Judd Winnick. <laughs> Who stole the Yeti from? There's a whole, I feel like there's yeah. like a family tree of yeti stealing well because i actually it was because he doesn't have yeti but he's got sasquatch so big right. shaggy humanoid based right. on gorilla well guess what uh, that 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 exactly thing exists in a lot of cultures so yeah exactly so the idea is yeti that used to be that you would maybe the australopithecus which is you know da, da. hi right. i was an anthropology minor so here we go so this is the stat I'm blocks for yeti there. This is what a Yeti looks like in the monster manual. It's like big and it's got horns and it's yelling and it's like, ah. Uh, and it is listed as Welcome chaotic evil. Welcome to the Himalayas every time. But here's the really fun. There's the information. Both the Yeti and the abominable Yeti, they both have intelligences of eight or higher and they speak the language of Yeti. So they are intelligent creatures. 
they have the ability they ha can do society they have a language they they have this and i'm like well damn they're just people who live in a really cold environment so they developed fur and they're really tall and big like you know so the let's talk about yet so what was oh the one of those feelings about those yet i totally if want I to play play in another campaign, am I going to get eaten by a Yeti too? Because I'm like, oh, maybe yeah, these are chill. Okay, I, these are nice. I have encountered owl bears probably twenty times more often than a Yeti. This probably was my third Yeti encounter. Yetis aren't people. Don't pick Yetis. People, people pick things that not a lot of people pick. Like we all fought a dragon. Well, I went up. <laughs> yeah. all, like pick something else. <laughs> There's a whole well, that's monsters what I was... manual. Hey, and if you're old enough, when and I will have fighting... the monstrous compendium. Stuff. I, I want to say I did not fight the dragon. I turned the dragon back into my sister. I mean, that is also an approach. We'll call that Plan B. So <laughs> I did not fight the dragon. When I, when I, I died to the dragon. So. <laughs> um, when I was going through deciding what portals would go to what plane, I was like, I want to do something. I was like, uh, I was like, sorry, Annika. I was like, oh, we could go Feywild, but everybody always goes to the Feywild. I'm like, oh, we could go, oh, we could go into the Nine Hells. Yeah. Well, like mean, everybody always goes Feywild, to the Feywild, or whatever. Story for Aster. That's all I'm saying. So I was fair, like, I was trying to pick worlds. Yeah, that people don't get to go into often. Yeah. So I was like, Mechanus, the elemental plane of Earth, the Frost Fell. So I'm thinking, I was like, what's the frost fell? I'm like, well, there's other things that you might encounter you don't know. I was like, but Yeti, that's what I decided. I'm like, the native, like, sentient species from the frost fell are Yeti. That's just what it is. They are the people, they are the ones that have communities and societies and homes and a language and a music and a culture and all that stuff. And so that's who you came across was these Yeti who were like, what the heck is this black thing? And why is it hot on the other side? <laughs> I have a question. Yes. yes. Talk about if, the Yeti. I don't know. Go. If Whistler had decided that the Yetis were definitely evil and had attacked them, would we have had to murder the nice Yeti family? In a I, I am universe. glad we did not have to find that out. <laughs> yeah, me too. Because um, Whistler sure seems to like to run in and attack things. So I'm kind of wondering if Whistler had eyeballed those Yetis and said, those are evil. What was to happened? be fair, to be fair, Whistler uh, is specifically running in and attacking fiends, like things that she notes as fiends. And I don't want to speak for for Whistler or for Whistler's player, um, but uh, I, I think that um, it was played true to character in that, uh, that that she was played true to character in that, you know, this was not an, an aggressive creature. It was a curious creature. And so therefore, uh, we were able to say, no, let's let's find out more. And Ari, I, I think, does, Ari does definitely, I think, do a very good job of does. It, does this character seem like a fiend to me? Um, and asks, I know, asks Sarah uh, when we have encounters. So, yeah, because it's, it's, it's been Aerie, one that died said, yeah. Yeah, it's because Ares playing as a classic paladin. Is it a fiend or undead? Like, those are the two, like, paladin, yeah. like, ah, must kill fiend undead. Because fiends and undead are, like, basically always bad. Especially her being a, a paladin of the, uh, of the Raven Queen undead completely anathema to what the Raven Queen's all about. So that's why you hear her always say, do I know if it's like, she's got a thing, divine sense, where you can do sensing undead and right. celestials and all that stuff. So that's why she's always asked. She's like, is this thing a fiend or is this thing undead? Because to her, like to her character, to Whistler, those are always bad, always never, never good. So, so, um, but yeah, the Yeti, how, how are you guys enjoying the frost fell? So I have to say, at, people don't know this because after the game ends, we usually end up chatting uh, afterwards, and we have a, you know, we have a whole chat that we have periodically. It's a and cool we down period. Talking. Yeah, and um, it was the first time that we were like, "Do we have to close the port? Like, is that mend?" <laughs> I think it was actually Adam because I think that because you know he likes to listen while we're playing, and he was like, "Are you gonna close the portal?" And it was the, I was like, "Wait, 
Do we have to? Like, maybe we could trade. <laughs> or do in yeah. chitinous armor. Um, what, what I found interesting <laughs> about Jack and that encounter, um, and, and I've talked before about how, like, a lot of my playing of these characters sometimes is just discovering what they'll do in any given encounter. Mm -hmm. um, that's how I. That's how I meet my characters. I sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's like the best. It, yeah, it's you discover your character as you play. Yeah, and uh, so yes, I, I knew that she was protective. I knew that like her first instinct was going to be like, do I have to? Uh, defend against the Yeti. Mm -hmm. um, she she was going to be the last one to get on board with this. Okay, these guys are friendly. Um, she was also the last last one to say yes. Let's go through the portal because it's farking cold. <laughs> <laughs> I got I had upsies. It's fine. <laughs> As we're. Robin is quite the opposite. Robin is the one who's immediately like, let's offer the Yeti some drink. I happen to have a bag full of whiskey today. Hey, you want to be pals? Welcome, random creature. Let's get drunk. Hey, you seem sentient. Have a drink. But then, but like, what? let's make you so cold, stupid. All the alcohol. And, like, once, but once, like, she, once Jack was on board, like, what I discovered was that she is very insistent on these um uh like protocols that you follow like if, if you're going to uh be a kind if you're going to go to another person's home the hospitality you're going to, the, exactly thank you i was having i was having a hard time like yeah. remembering that word um Ms. yeah so these hospitality protocols that are on the guest as much as they are on uh, the person being hospitable. And so uh, I didn't know that about her. And that was really fun to discover like, oh no, no. If if you're going, if we're going to eat, we're going to like make sure that we, <laughs> my friends are vegetarian and I don't want to insult these people. <laughs> yeah, that yeah was fun. about that. Like, maybe episode two or three, I made, I don't even know, it just came out of me, like a throwaway comment about Robin being a vegan. And ever since then, I've wondered, like, is this true? Is this true? Is this true? And we had the breakfast scene, and Robin didn't order any meat or any dairy. And then here we are at the Yeti, and, and, and Robin's like, yeah, I'm a vegan, like, for real. And I'm like, you're a cat. You're a, <laughs> you're a vegan. You're a cat. Like, but it's just true. But... Robin wasn't gonna like double check every little thing, but Robin's definitely not gonna eat. Um, so yeah, um, but Robin, I treat you know, eating are... meat. So I treat eating meat as so culturally raised by a an animal who literally cannot digest meat, right? Yeah, and in fairly traditional D and D, elves also cannot digest meat. Um, and so I think I come at being a vegetarian as not a, it, it's, it's not a choice that has been made, but a, um, sort of a biological imperative that I just can't, it would make me sick. I can't really digest it. I do eat, like I can eat cheese, which minotaurs don't eat because they can't digest it. Right. Um, but yeah, so I I treat it for me like a like a biological imperative that it's it's not necessarily it's become cultural in the way that many things like that do, right? So minotaurs culturally are vegan, but that's just because they literally cannot eat meat, cannot digest cheese. Um and I think of elves being very similar in that they can't can't digest meat. Right. Right. Now, three, like now, now we got three cats That's on screen, cool. and my cat's about to leave. Okay, like we I'm got three. I, mean, I could get a dog. Oh, is he here? Robin is Our... ethically vegan. Robin can't. Oh. Robin wouldn't put it on anyone else, but they personally just can't stomach the idea of eating another creature because they are so in love with love life all creatures, and yeah. all other creatures. So it's. 
it's an ethical thing. It's just like their family eats meat. Like it's not like it's, they were raised that way. They just in their travels, they couldn't do it. And, and being vegan, um, cats are lactose intolerant, as far as I know. So I think Robin, probably the same as Finland. Like, yeah, uh, the being vegan partly is ethical. Like the consumption of flesh is against Robin's ethics. But dairy, I think, would actually just make Robin sick. So, so they tried not to. They were like, so my cat, yeah. Our cat Caboose, he loves yogurt. And but yogurt doesn't love. So, but we don't, we, don't, we don't eat dairy because I can't have dairy. And so my dad gets coconut yogurt. And Caboose loves that shit. Like, if my dad opens up the yogurt lid, my cat. So do you like how animals magically do that? Like pets just, where are they? I don't know. All I got to do is like open the fridge or open this bag and poof, they've like transported themselves from another plane to right there. Incidentally, I am an omnivore. I am not vegan or vegetarian. I am that an is omnivore. Not a bleed over, that no. is not a bleed over of my own self. That is just Robin. Yeah, yeah I'm, 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 I'm an omnivore. So. Yeah, I'm I I'm a vegetarian, so I, I get I and I and I'm personally a vegetarian for the same reason that Robin is. Um, it's both ethical and I now we're just talking about personal stuff. Um, uh, both ethical and like I can't stand the idea of eating another creature and all that stuff. But also I've just found as myself this not necessarily a biological imperative because I am human, so I've got the teeth and the digestive system that can digest meat. But I just feel better when I go plant based. My body because I have digestive issues. My body just feels better when I don't have to digest meat. So I just don't eat it. So yeah, that's... I mean, maybe if I play Robin long enough, I'll go back to being vegetarian. I was vegetarian for a long time and then life circumstances changed that for me. But yeah. who knows? I... So yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm not vegan over. because I am not vegan because as much as um, uh, I am lactose intolerant, I do love cheese and yogurt and stuff like that. I and mean, also those, and I do eat honey because this goes into the ethical thing of like, the creatures don't die to provide those items for me. And then we can go into the big thing about honey and how it actually API, like, like beekeepers are actually doing more for bees than vegans not eating honey and we can do all that stuff. But my question, the next question I was gonna ask is, cause we were at, we were talking to, um, we talked about hit on two of these points. The, the Yeti and Robin getting the Yeti drunk. Well, what happened was the oh, Yeti got God. Robin drunk. Yeah. Um, uh, as Robin was like, here, have my alcohol. Pleasant alcohol. And the Yetis are like, yeah, here's our moonshine. <laughs> and Robin, like, Robin got a little. Do it. Robin, Robin, whose inhibitions are probably fairly low in the most part, let their inhibitions drop even more. And a certain phrase was said to Jacquard, which brings me to a topic that I really want to, I love talking about, I think we should talk about is romance in TTRPGs. <laughs> if you guys want to talk about this specific, I mean, we can, we can just dip it to like relationships, like, you know, platonic relationships and stuff as well. But I just thought, because I've never, there are a lot of like panels or people generally talking about romance and RPGs. It's always talking about like battle tactics and stuff like that. But I'm like, nah, man, RPGs are a role playing game. Have had a battle they love for it. <laughs> so, so I just want to start by letting the audience know that um, Amelie and I are not romantic partners. We, we, we have a little bit of a text flirt going because we're both cute as hell, but we, we, we didn't know each other before this game. We only know each other through this game with a little bit of like, uh, you know, friendship is developed outside of it. So it's not that we're bringing our romance to the table. I think we just have a hella good chemistry. And so our characters are like, okay, look at you. Um, what's fun is that before that, before the owl couplet, I had, Robin was working on another drawing that uh, I'm going to exclusively show here at the OOC because Jakob has not seen it yet. But Jakob was talking about how much they missed home. Asked asked Jakob to uh, Robin asked Jakob to describe home, and then Robin started drawing Jakob's home as a gift. So Jakob is going to get a little uh, a little drawing of what Robin is imagining their home must look like based on their description. Because Robin uh, kind of has a hell of a crush. I don't know if anyone else knows. Not that we haven't noticed or anything. <laughs> <laughs> we, 
Which, uh, Amelie, yeah, what's go your ahead. take on it? Um, so, Jack is... Uh, Jack comes from a culture where, like, it's not, like, marriage is, is partially about romance, but it's not a thing that is, um, it, 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 it's also partially political, and it's also partially, like, her mom, her mom was slightly, it was, it was a bit weird from for her community in that her mom was a, a traveler and nomadic and uh would go would take her on these you know huge long trips going everywhere around the world to trade her uh goods um and her mom had a partner in every port basically uh so jack is very familiar with a, 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 a more casual approach to partnership and dating than um, what she is experiencing with Robin. Like she's she's not experiencing this. Uh, yes, this is good for now, and I plan on leaving afterwards. She's wanting to see like some she, in her mind and and this hasn't been brought up at, at all actually no. uh so <laughs> exclusive content um she's worried about what's going to happen when she does return to uh her community with the orcs because she's like i don't think robin is going to want to follow me and i don't think robin it, it you know, I, she she does have a she actually uh, Jack does have a boyfriend back home, um, and uh, like they 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 ended their relationship while Jack was out and about because that again that's what she's used to, um, and like she she has no idea what is happening because she has a she does have a lot of feelings for Robin that are not uh, platonic in nature. But she's scared to act on them because not only does she have the clueless lesbian trope of like, oh my God, does this person like me more than more than a friend? Um, yes, Jack, yes. Uh, but also, <laughs> you know, she's trying to figure out, would this actually even work long term? Because I want it to be long term. It's cute, too, because they haven't really even talked about their relationship styles. They haven't talked about if they have other partners or not. Like, I'm sure that Jack's even wondering, is Robin polyamorous or not? Because if I, if she has a significant partner already, that could be a deal breaker. Uh, well, Robin, you'll have to find out through the <laughs> role play what Robin's situation is. I mean, I am polyamorous, so it's possible that Robin maybe already is. I mean, I'm not vegan, and Robin is, but uh, in my experience, Robin is so open-hearted. Robin is almost kind of, almost like you're Jack's mom kind of goes around and has different loves in different places. Like Robin, I think also has a very big heart and enjoys people, enjoys things. Um, I can't wait for the fanfic of uh, the half orc and uh, tabaxi dwarf or tabaxi gnome uh discovering themselves uh together <laughs> should be interesting um, also another thing that robin kind of worries about but hasn't really come up yet is whether or not because robin is gender fluid um but has a body that jack couldn't possibly know what's happening with Robin's body. And so there is a concern from, from Robin of like, if the Jack and I did try to hook up, like, would I be acceptable? Is what I bring to the table okay? Both because we're different species, both of us half species, but also like, does the way that my body functions meet the Jack's expectations? Uh, so I don't know if we'll ever actually get to that. It that sounds like Jack, sounds like Jack and Robin needing an intentionality talk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Sarah, I'm sorry. I hear that you're. I see that you're talking, but you're on oh, mute. Oh, mute. You're on mute. 
Sorry, I was gonna say that can be one of our like just simply role play sessions, our like Yas after dark. After dark. Where it's just after like it's just like it's just like I don't even have to be there, but it's just it's just Jack and Robin having a. We talk. prefer I mean, you not. It's not a private. <laughs> yeah, I don't need to be there, but it could be for our Patreon, our patrons. We can be like, you guys, if you want to hear uh, Jack and Robin talk about where they're going with this, uh, be a patron. It'll be fifty dollars. That's a pay per view session. Yes. I also want to point thing. out. I also want to point out that, like, while we've been playing at this will they, won't they for several weeks now and, and several months now, um, Jack and Robin have known each other for like a whole week. <laughs> yeah. <I know. laughs> a whole ass right. week. <laughs> yeah, they're still at flirty notes. Yeah. Middle school flirty notes is where they're at. This, this is, this is definitely, um, New new relationship energy in RE, like... Yeah. And then all the other party members are just kind of like... I, yeah, I like... I like, <laughs> like Finland, Finland is like the least helpful because she doesn't know what up either. <laughs> and so she... <laughs> so she Reason going, Jack went to her mom. Right? <laughs> I'm like, mm. eh? I don't know. I mean, if you like them... Hey. I think you like hold hands and watch sunsets. I have no idea. I think chew Robin cut, and chew cud together. That's what my people do. I don't know. Robin's personality is such that Robin would probably make a move if Robin weren't so afraid of like, look how tiny I am and look how strange I am and look how gorgeous she is. Why would she even really want to go out with me? And if she did, what if she rejected my body? Because my body, I don't even know what she expects of my body. And so that's kind of, I think why Robin hasn't been like, so. Which metagaming is the, is really super duper funny because that's like the least of Jack's worries. Because <laughs> uh, I, I specifically have not even determined if Jack is trans by our definitions. Because orcs don't have a, a, a word for trans. Like, by right, definition... So there's another thing. Yeah. Like, a, a body, body build does not factor into gender for orcs. Um, and w which is a aspect of... So, th that is character aspect being built into the character. Or that is creator aspect being built into the character that... Um, I, I didn't, I, I wanted a culture that uh, trans isn't a thing. Everybody's trans, I guess, and nobody's trans. Like, it, it's it's just not a thing because Where sex body, and gender are not, can, yeah. are not even considered that they should be yeah. They're, like, it, suggestive of the other. Exactly. Um, so I specifically haven't decided or and, and I'm not going to decide what Jack's sex is. I'm not going to. You can't make me. I know what Robin's <laughs> is, but I don't know if I want to say. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. I know. Well, I will say because here's the thing. We do have, you know, and with, especially because we're doing this and we're putting it online. We will have, like, you will never see an explicit sex scene. It'll be always a fade to black. So we're never going to find that out on what? screen anyway. Okay. Sorry. I, I quit. <laughs> If anything like that happens, and like we will have a fade to black. Um, I mean, like not that I don't mind DMing that, but we did. We are making this for all audiences, so that would definitely be a patron exclusive. Um, uh, if like if you want to exclusive, exclusive well, there's... I was I, the concern was, and it ended up when I when I wasn't around, and you guys had the episode where Robin was kidnapped, and then they bathed Robin, and when I heard that they had bathed Robin, I robin the robin was like oh my gosh like what if they saw like that like robin felt very awkward and then i found out you guys had been so respectful of robin and and had not disrobed robin had washed robin in a way that was really respectful of robin's body and that made me so happy and it made robin so happy yeah it was a very was practical very choice it's <laughs> just easier to wash the whole thing together <laughs> but that was so beautiful because i thought like oh like Robin is very protective of of their own privacy around that because they know that when people see their body, they 
in Robin's experience, they, they may view them differently. Now, the Jack, obviously, being an orc, wouldn't have that, but Robin didn't come from an orcish background, so, so Robin likes to keep that private so that people will accept Robin the way that they are and not potentially, like, have other ideas about them. So that was great, and I was so happy. And I should have known that you guys, of all people, would be over the, overly respectful. Yeah, we weren't stripping down the cat. It was also, but yeah, it was very much people were like, we got to wash the clothes, too, so just leave the clothes on the cat. Just uh, dunk the whole cat in the water. I promise it was also very thoughtful. I wasn't there. I was cleaning weapons. So, I um, what I see. That's, <laughs> yeah. I held the head, made sure to yeah. So in my in my past playing experience, we haven't actually there hasn't been a lot of relationship stuff. So um like in the very first group I was in, like I said, there's two girls and eight guys. And like it was college and like adding a whole extra level of relationship drama that was fake to the like real relationship drama that was already going on probably just would have been too much <laughs> like, nobody really <laughs> but uh there was a there was a campaign where uh there were characters who got involved with each other and i thought it was really really interesting the way it got played because then there was very much a whenever we were in combat an awareness of how that would change the way that those characters made decisions, uh, their reactions in those moments. Um, and one of the characters got almost killed, like, like was pretty, we were pretty sure we had lost this character because they miscalculated, right? Calculated a miscalculation uh, based on wanting to save their love interest. Right. And that's mm. like, that's good role playing people. Right. To, to think about it. Don't like to think about what a relationship does in those would do in those moments that are not necessarily a real, like we don't get locked into caves with big dragons often in our mundane lives. Right. But if you were, if it did happen, that it is your job to like take out a big monster and bring home some part of this horde, right? And there's that element of, and it doesn't have to be a, a romantic relationship. You could be playing somebody's sibling, right? Mentor, any, you Mentor, know, or anything best like friend. that, right? Yeah. What, what, what are the faults in that? Because so caught up in how am I going to perfectly play this combat, right? How do I use combat statistics to like have a badass moment? Because we all love the badass moment. But when you like take just a couple of seconds to be like, but how might my character screw this up because I'm this currently more concerned stay out right over there. Um, you get some really good sort of goosebumpy moments at a game table. And I think those are that's hard to do. It's hard to step out of the mechanics uh, in combat and do that. But, you know, props to people who who make create those moments for sure. So my my kind of general thing is a, as a DM is uh, I love having characters form relationships and that's all relationships, platonic like, you know, friends, romantic, whatever it is. Like, we already have, like, Aster just completely being protective of the himbo that is Whistler because Whistler has no impulse control. So, like, so, like, so, like, we already see this relationship that they have as friends where Aster is like, no, 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 holds the cloak back, hold back the, the bird, you know, it's doing that. Because that's normally, because my other game that I play with Herman, my monk character, it's basically world reversed because my friend, my friend's character Zoe is very much like that to Teak like oh let's go do this and she's just like how about no and then Why? she she had to leave her, like the player had to leave because um scheduling got in the way and so her character left and then of course the security left so now t is just like let's go let's go but also just really like sad because their friend's gone now so um i've i've had to oh, ask ahead, a dm like 
I I've had to ask a DM before, like, hey, do I need to re-roll a character? Because I cannot... I, my character is not bonding with any of these other characters and she has no reason to stay around. Mm -hmm. um, and so like we ended up we ended up metaing just a little bit in order to give her that uh, that re the, some relationship with uh, the other characters because otherwise I was just gonna be like it, no, she's gonna go off and find her sister. <laughs> yeah, there's that there's that thing because when you're when you're creating your character, you're almost creating it in a in a vacuum. You know, you're sitting there, especially with D and D. You know, with your character sheet and your player's handbook, and you know, maybe you've got Xanthar's guide to to everything or like whatever, and you're you know you're figuring out all these things. Um, and unlike things like um, unlike game systems like Monster of the Week or whatever, where you're kind of collaboratively putting these things together in D and D, there's often this issue where you conceptualize a character in a vacuum um, and you've got all these these ideas about your motivations and things and then when you know when the rubber meets the road they end up not making a lot of sense um, like I know I've had this so uh, people who've seen OOCs the OOCs before or have seen uh, us chatting in other venues will know that Finlan is actually a remake of a character that I already had um, many, 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 many years ago. And so in my head, you know, I still had a lot of those ideas about the character that she was very mistrusting of people naturally and that she was very hard and didn't like want to talk a lot, which was easy when you're at a game table with 10 people, <laughs> right? But then I found out that, that that wasn't a way I could play Finlan, you know, um, that it didn't feel right in this situation. And um, my husband has a thing where if you play a character for a few campaign, like a few, um, you know, days or whatever, or many days, and it's just not working for whatever reason, then you get an opportunity to rework whether you want to rework it entirely or slot in a new one and i think that's great because i i think at the end of the day you want to tell compelling stories with compelling characters and when stuff is not working and something feels very weakly bonded it it kind of lets the storytelling down a bit you know um, well, I, I always like to give this example. Um, I, I'm very lucky and that in my, especially my game playing experience as like an adult, um, I have gotten to play games with a lot of queer and femme people. So most of my playing experience, especially because I said to be an adult, um, are with people who um, aren't cis white guys and who, some people are, a lot of them are also new to RPGs, new to D&D &D and stuff like that. So, and everybody always talks about like, when you start playing an RPG, you start playing D&D, you, you talk about your character and you talk about the cool things that happen. And we still talk about things that happened in our game two, three years ago, but it's hardly ever, we hardly ever talk about, do you remember that time when we did this and we killed the big monster or whatever? It's, do you remember that time that Royson gave Nori the sex talk? Do you remember that time that we had to do a resurrection uh, ritual for, um, or this character and we all cry. Do you remember this time? And it's almost all character moments. It's almost mm -hmm. all, it's it's not about the big combat or whatever. It's almost yeah. always the smaller character times. Like, do you remember the time that that this character almost got kidnapped and you know we had to go to the rescue or whatever it is. It's the moment, it's, it's not the big combat moments that people remember and continue to talk about. It's the way that these characters interact and these ways that these characters are creating this um, for lack of a better word, human story. Uh, even though you may not be an actual human, but we're humans, so there's that. Um, so as again, as a DM, that's always my goal is you know to 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 give the combat experience, but to give the other encounters that you can have, like with the owl bears and like the friendly encounters with the yetis and you know all these other things, like people. Are going to react to different things and this is something i was going to talk about we talk about romance in dnd my general philosophy is romance in dnd if as the dm i am more than happy if i create an npc that a pc is interested in i'm never going to uh, like create an npc and be like this is made for this person to romance that's not what i'm going to do but if i ever create an npc and a person's like hey i want to go i'm like 
we can do that. But I always find it is more compelling to have some sort of romance or relationships between the PCs. Because I have so many NPCs rattling around in my head that like, find, and the, the NPCs are around each other all the time. Like the NPCs you might see once every five games or something like that. So to create a real relationship with that character, be it friends or romantic or whatever it is, even as like a father or a mother, like having Jack's mom, playing her was really great, but you don't see her all the time. So you don't see that big complicated relationship that they're going to have. So, um, my general philosophy is just like create interesting NPCs and let the players go from there. If you guys want to talk to Palu more, if you guys want to find out more about Lucara's family, whatever it is, it's there. I have it all written down. I have ideas, but try to get you guys to focus on what's going on in the group and with each other more so than all of these various NPCs that I've created. So that's my kind of general talk about like D and D and relationships. It's is any relationship, again, whatever kind, platonic, familial, romantic, is going to be more interesting when it's played between two PCs rather than a PC and an NPC. Speaking of so. things to remember, remember that time that we got drunk with the Yetis and Whistler passed out and none of us seemed to notice or care? <laughs> like, I was drunk, so I, I feel like Robin has no culpability here. But... Most of you were not, and Whistler was like, was it Whistler passed out on the floor? Look, so I asked it anyone was to partying. I, ha I come from a culture check, that drink a or make lot. sure Whistler was okay. Shit, so Whistler. So, checked. Yeah. Was Whistler breathing? Okay. Yes. Fine. Bro, uh, bro, you also have to understand that Whistler is also like the equivalent of like 18 years old, I think. Like Whistler is very young as well. So this is like Aster, Whistler's first I time. I apologize, Aster, for not acknowledging the work that you did. To <laughs> I was too busy being stupid drunk. I also thought it was really, really cool that Aster did not partake and was not bullied into it, and that we had good representation of of that. Like that was, I love that, and I'm glad that no one tried too hard because, like, I as a rule try to make sure that no one feels peer pressure. But my character was not really in a place to to help with that so I was glad that it worked out okay yeah Jack was yeah. definitely like oh goodness like I'm n I don't want to pressure you and hospitality oh god <laughs> yeah I, well like here's my my oh right Annika go ahead I was like with, with that like cool thing because at the end of the episode I did say that like I came up with more stuff for Aster for like stuff and I've been talking to Sydney because Sydney wants to be a guest on it, and she wants to play a character that like knows Aster. Um, it's my mom. Hello. Hi, mom. Hi, mom. Georgia. Hi, mom. <laughs> Hi, mom. I can't hear you because that's it. Georgia. But, yeah. uh, but so I was told, like after the episode, I messaged Sydney about a bunch of stuff as well. Um, so yeah, whenever Sydney comes, will be great times. I think it's so I love well, I was that say, because you and Sydney you and Sydney are already best friends in real life and so like you get this dynamic where you can talk about all these things that you might know about each other's characters which is like a whole like great dynamic right that you can well, do and, like, last, I think it was last episode I did mention that Aster was previously in a band right and Sydney he broke up <laughs> Sydney's character is from that band Oh, that's going to be fun. So that, is what, or that is what it is. We're putting the band back together. <laughs> back together. Yes. So, so like, um, uh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Somebody go. Okay. I was going to say, but conversely, um, we have like Finn and Jack, who are best friends, whereas Amelie and I literally met at the conception of this project. We have <laughs> never met in person <laughs> at all. <laughs> Meanwhile, Sydney and I had the in same the house pandemic. number. Right? Literally, so I met Sydney because she lived on the street in front of my house, like the street, the other street. We have the same, we have the same house number. So we would get her mail and she would get our mail. And that's how we met. <laughs> it was because same house of number, but different uh, streets? Same house number, different streets. Okay. Yeah, yeah. If it's the same house number, same street, that's the same house. 
Yeah, so it was different streets, same house. I home. didn't notice there was a whole other family living in the house with us. <laughs> so weird. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm if you live in a duplex, duplex. yeah, it's like, yeah, 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 yeah. you're they, usually an A or a B. Yeah, yeah. But, so they moved out over the course over the summer, and then the new people came. And actually, this hoodie, I had it was I thought it was lost in the mail for a week. Now it was just at those people's house, and I was like, hey, yeah. by the way, we have the same house number, <laughs> or like my mom went I over have there. Stuff. <laughs> oh, stuff. Hey, Amelie. What up? Who's who's over here for me? No, not Amelie. I'm sorry, Annika. Who's over here for me? Hey. Sarah. Hi. Who's over here for me? Nobody. Nobody. For, on, Nobody. on Twitch, me. on Twitch, you're at the bottom by yourself. What? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, on Twitch, we... it's a cube of four, and then there's you at the bottom. Is like so. Yeah. <laughs> You've got nobody on either side of you on Twitch. But like I can't high five anybody. You can high five I'm up. You can high five them up. And Tanya and I, you can go like this, and Tanya and I can go down, and okay. we can high five you. Wait, which side Wait. am I on? I don't. I don't. I'm just gonna do both hands because I don't know. <laughs> I'll just go like this. Oh my God. So, yeah, there we go. High fives. High fives. See for, for me, I've got Amelie over here, so I tried to high five Amelie and realized Amelie didn't see what I see. And I got And see, I, I was doing I this because like in my screen, yeah, you are you're you're over there. You're there. So yeah, for my screen, just like so in the game, so Robin's at the bottom looking up at everybody. Um, so this is what I was gonna say, talking about uh you do have this we have talked about this before in the game. Um uh, talking about uh, intoxicants of whatever form, uh, be it alcohol or be it uh, like a drug type thing. I myself am a teetotaler. I myself, Sarah, have never had alcohol. I've never had alcohol in my life. I've never, uh, I've never smoked a cigarette. I've never smoked or done any kind of listed substance, you know, any kind of class A, B, C, whatever substance. It's just a personal choice that I have made not to do these things. Uh, not that, and, and then, but here's the other thing is I'm also a, uh, what we consider like an abolitionist. I think a lot of things should be legal that aren't legal right now because they're plants. Anyway, that's like a whole nother thing. Um, but I am always going to present opportunities for food and drink and possible intoxicants if that is something that people are searching out for. It is something that is a part of a lot of cultures, um, uh, especially like talking about the culture that I've kind of based uh, yetis on, um, which are based on the Arctic cultures of, uh, so Sami and, um, Native American cultures in Canada. So people who live in a harsh, harsh environment, um, stuff like that, eating a lot of meat and, you know, whale fat and seal fat and stuff like that. Um, and the, the production and the, not saying even alcohol, but the production and drinking of a drink together as like a hospitality, um, a, as a hospitality thing. So if a character like Aster does not want to partake in any intoxicants, none of the NPCs are going to pressure them into doing that because I, I trust me, I have had plenty of experiences, especially in college where people tried to pressure me into drinking or doing something else because it's what you do when you're in college, you know? Oh, it's fine. I'm, I'm, I'm like, no. Like I'm, I'm, I understand no as a, as a single sentence since I've, you know, um, so I'm just like, nah, nah, I'm good. Nah, I'm good. Also, by the way, if you, if everybody gets drunk, who's going to take care of you guys? Um, Me as like the only underage person out of Sherwood. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> that actually um, hangs out with the people. That who never drink. stopped me when I was under. Yeah, we need Astro to be DD forever. Exactly. So my my NPCs, even even if they are like the offering of the alcohol or the food or whatever, um, the NPCs like e like if with Finlan and Robin not eating the meat, the Yetis weren't going to be offended by it. Now Jack doesn't know that. Jack's you know got her own thing, but the Yetis would kind of understand. They're like maybe they just don't like whatever kind of meat we were serving them or you know whatever it is. They're not going to be upset um, because that so much information that I have that the that I have not shared with the PCs that that as a as a DM I don't want to make anybody upset with anything like that so I know that about the Yeti culture that I have created because I didn't share it with anybody now had I shared it beforehand and said hey you guys this is going to happen they eat meat you know well, how do you want to react to that but if I'm presenting a an unfamiliar culture or circumstance to the players that they do not have prior knowledge of I am going to do my level best 
to make sure nobody is uncomfortable in said situation. So that's why I try to just kind of keep things kind of even keeled and, you know, whatever. Now, that's different, like talking with Zareth coming from a completely different plane of existence. And that's something that Zareth as a PC is different. His culture is completely off kilter from what these people know. But that's something that Zareth as a PC is dealing with, not me as the DM. I do. I can't. I'm more of a position so of power. Bad. Like, of all the things, like, that we've lost right due to technical difficulties that yeah. whole thing talking about talking about trade cultures and talking about uh funerary practices and like blowing his mind with this yeah. concept of caring supportive societies i am like i wish i wish we could almost like recreate it because it was probably my favorite moment uh so far uh, where you had somebody, like you said, who's just so far removed. So we all talk about how we come from different cultures, right? Minotaur, Orcish. Uh, do you live? You live with the gnomes, right? Or you live with the tobacco? You live in gnomes. So uh, uh, Robin is from. Robin was raised in a cosmopolitan, like a huge. Big okay, city so like a whole bunch. With, okay, and then yeah. after has yeah. house. Yeah, whatever the so we all have like our own cultures that we, that are not, not, you know, they're not the same, but they exist in the same world. And because there's trade and because that's the way culture works, there's going to be like some overlap or some similarities. And then the things that you end up talking about are those like weird little differences. Like you, you boil lobster, you don't just chuck it in the fire, you know, like that kind of thing. But now you have somebody who is literally not from this planet who is massively confused about everything. And I kind of love that because when you have to explain something that you've taken for granted, somebody, it makes you have to really stop and think about it. You're like, All right, it is um, it is 1.30. We've been going for about an hour and 30 minutes. 20 minutes I would 20. say, um, yeah, hour, 20 minutes, something like that. I'm gonna have to bounce in just a second. Um, uh, I've got stuff I need to do because it's my day off. So I do have things that I have to do at yeah. my house. Um, uh, I was just gonna say, so, uh, speaking of, I'm gonna, I'm gonna piggyback, we always piggyback, so we do in this group, uh, of, of Tanya talking about White Wolf and cyberpunk stuff, is I think another subject of one of our OOCs could be talking about other game systems that we have played, why we like those game systems, and other game systems that we may be playing on Yas too, because we've already played with, uh, Monster of the Week, and we played Slayers, and we played Fate. So we've played in our one shots, we've played uh, some different game systems. So I think having a fun talk about, not necessarily about Yas, but about just TTRPGs in general and other game systems that we've played and what we've liked and why we've liked them and so on and so forth, would be a fun, interesting talk that we could have for for folks. Cause I know Pax is a really big fan of Pugmire, so. <laughs> I'm gonna get cyberpunk on everybody. Shocker. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, is it, are there any parting parting comments people want to throw out before we leave this this out of character discussion? I guess I, you know That's... me, I like to do a wrap up, and I think yeah. the, the wrap ups are when you're when you're considering character and you're considering story. Think about relationships, and that means all kinds, right? That web of relationships, and that it's not just the mechanics that moves you from one fight to the next fight that makes a good game. I mean, those big fights can be super cathartic, but I don't think it's, it's not what makes a game that sticks with you, you know? Um, and the other one is, uh, you know, the books, I've said this before, I'll say it again. The books are all guidelines. Um, mix it up, change it up, because especially when you have players who have been doing this a long time, it makes it keeps the game fresh and exciting and new and encounters well, like are that, interesting. that rock lizard i just made i just took the giant lizard stat and and added some stuff to it like i just i was oh, like it I doesn't exist it. in the monster manual me just i was me just going i need something i can't and use I a spider right because like a a I yeah, so I was like, I can't use spiders. I'm like, what else has a thing? I was like, lizards have sticky tongues. I was like, yeah, a rock lizard. We'll do that. So I just <laughs> added some stats to it, and play, messed around with it a little bit, and there you go. You have a giant oh, rock see, lizard. Look, arachnophobia makes people get like more creative with stuff. Creative. <laughs> it was just like with Slayers. You had to get creative. Yeah. <laughs> you do okay. 
Um, I'm lazy. Do something to. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that's the other thing is like, if you have the resources, like I have, well, you can see my RPG shelf and more now into my kitchen because my mom has knocked my backdrop down a little bit. Look, RPG shelf, kitchen supplies. Okay. Um, <laughs> with our shop, you can see I've got some cups and there's some sparkling water. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, these, these are my dishes. <laughs> Um, you are lucky they are organized right now. I actually cleaned my kitchen a few days ago, so they're actually put away. Um, uh, is, is if you've got all of these resources and the internet and DMs Guild and Itch and all of these other resources. Oh, just, oh my gosh. Home home brews. Home brews. People's home brews. And like, <laughs> you're going to find all these cool creatures and cool things that you can do and like insert into your game where you don't, I mean, it's called Dungeons and Dragons. I understand that. And yeah, there might be a dragon in this game at some point, but or you never know what kind of dragon it's going to be, or a dungeon. Um, uh, but there's so, so cool. many other creatures. There's so many other types of encounters. There can be, they got caught in a like rainstorm. And so they went like, you know, environmental encounters. Um, there's actually a part in Tasha's about environmental encounters and like floods and, you know, glaciers and stuff like that or like if there's like a magic surge or whatever it is there's so many other things and then um I was, we keep talking about Aerie and though Aerie's not here Aerie loves a political game Aerie, Aerie loves a political game and we haven't gotten into that but you could do like especially urban or games where it's like it's all urban and you've got like thieves guilds and you've got fighting you know all this whatever it is there's so much more you can do with D&D like cyberpunk you, like cyberpunk <laughs> yes I'm bringing that back <laughs> And we're gonna I, have an OOC. It's just about cyberpunk, and it's just gonna be Tanya <laughs> talking about cyberpunk. The rest oh, of no, we'll, we'll, bring, we'll bring David in on that one. Okay, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're just gonna be um, like, uh -huh. but like, uh -huh. the, so Adam uh -huh. has a world that he created um, where uh, it's like the equivalent of every four months or something. Magic goes away in the world for two weeks, and it's called the dead time. And like play like it's just such an odd concept, right? Because in all of ours, our ma like if you have a mage or whatever, it all it works all the time. But imagine if it didn't. What would your character like a have to out. Do? Right? Yeah, like a like a brownout. Like you've got no connection to the power. What do you do now? What do you do? And like those kind of things make worlds so interesting to play in for me that because it's like my depressive cycle. <laughs> I was just thinking that kind of like, that was like in Taz with Merle. When Pan just <laughs> wouldn't <laughs> talk to him and he was like, Pan! <laughs> it's true. That's like, right when you've got no, what do you do? And that's kind of like the, the same concept of like, there's a big storm. Mm -hmm. What if you can't I hit it with a hammer? Right? Okay. I had a okay. I had a character who had a building fall on her. It was actually the original Fenlin. Had a part of a building fall on her. And um yeah. <laughs> and and, and uh, I wonder why Jack is worried about her. Right. Oh. <laughs> it's my bad. My fault. <laughs> Don't understand instruction. My, my friend who liked it, who well, fight well, just as well as me, but is much more fragile. I uh That's, and the I'm whole thing was I ended up losing basically temporarily parts of me right so like couldn't use an arm and could barely use a leg but still was going out and fighting and so we adjusted all my stats and everything to be like what would happen because like this is a character who's not going to sit it out right who's not going to be benched i'm not red shirting it so what happens if you basically got your arm in a sling you know yep. just <laughs> When, if we ever get Ari to do one of these, you should ask Ari about the game that we that she and I first started playing because I created entire stats for making adolescent characters. Um, that's hey, the game. are we gonna talk about like oh like some old school D and D like different stats for genders? Oh, we should talk about that. Point. Yes, different stats for genders and different like it used to be. I don't know how long you guys have played D and D, but it used to be if you were a female character, your charisma was higher than a male character. But your strength was lower. Base stat. Okay. Your strength was lower. So actually, yeah. before we leave, I forgot. It's official now. Yeah. Uh, we are doing a panel at SnailCon. Oh, yeah? Uh, an online convention. Oh, that's right. Um, I don't remember what I called it. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, really? You were like, I was like, what like, I think, is what I called Fems it. Fems and Dems in gaming? Okay. And so, yeah. Yeah, so we're going to be doing that. Uh, they have not released the link to Discord yet. 
Uh, but I will For the be... schedule. We don't schedules, even know when it's yeah. going to be. Well, because they're still trying to get all of the panelists onto Discord. So. Yeah. But, so we'll um, let you know when we yes, know. I will put the link to their Instagram uh, in the bio of our YouTube of when this goes up on YouTube. So you guys can check that out. Uh, follow them on Instagram. They're run by some cool people. And I know like two of them. So yeah. And then also we can also put information on Facebook. Yes. When yes. we get when more we get information. Discord link it on. Can put it up. And Twitter. Well, let's put all the information on all our socials. Yes. So yeah. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all that stuff. So you can have us talking about having people. Yay. As we talk about TTRPG some more. That's all we know. Yep. I, I, I'm just playing with this pair of scissors, so I'm just like... That's all we know. Uh, that and then yeah. some of us make panel. games. <laughs> yeah. <gasps> so, um... We had a closing wrap-up by Tanya. Uh, Pax, Amelie, you want to throw anything out there before we close this OOC up? Anybody? No? Okay. Closed. Okay. I have short little fat fingers. We love you guys. And we'll see y'all uh, at a later time. Next On the flip Thursday side. For the next OOC. Yeah. Yes. Segment. Now I gotta deal with my cat. <laughs>